All right, so turn to the left in your Bible. We go into the book of Jonah this morning. And we're going to take all of Jonah chapter 1. We're going to do a four-week walk through, you know, four chapters, four weeks through this little book of Jonah. And uh, the title for the sermon is, you know, Go Toward the Graceful God. Go Toward the Graceful God. Well, in the days leading up to the arrival of our, our son, Ezra James, he should be here September 7th, uh, we have been getting ready. We have been hanging out with our married friends who have small children. We have been saying, what should we buy? What should we not buy? What do we need? What do we not need? And we've been purchasing all sorts of, of must-have items, or at least items that we've been told we must have. And uh, early on toward the beginning of the, the pregnancy, Lauren told me that I am in charge of selecting books for little Ezra to read. And I was excited about that. I said, I can do that. That's something I understand. I'll do books. And one such book that I really enjoyed as a kid, it still brings a smile to my face now as an adult. We actually saw this book on a, a shelf over at a friend's house recently, and I had to pull it down and, and thumb through it. And it's a classic. Maybe you know it. It's called Where the Sidewalk Ends. It's a book of poems for, for kids. It's by a, a poet named Shel Silverstein. But what's so interesting about this book of poems is that they're, they're playfully dark. <laughs> they're, that's probably the best way to put it. They're playfully dark in some cases because he will use satire in order to make these poems really stick out, in order to get, get your attention and make a point. Uh, it's illustrated in, in black and white, and it contains a whole bunch of different memorable lines and images. But I found one right toward the front of the book that made me laugh out loud again this week. And I have it printed for you in your bulletin, so you can actually look at it. And it's called Carrots. You've probably seen this one. Um, and it basically <laughs> says this. They say that carrots are good for your eyes. They swear that they improve your sight. But I'm seeing worse than I did last night. You think maybe I ain't using them right. And if you're looking at this, you have an image of a guy who jammed two carrots right into his eye sockets. Right? That's meant to make a kid crack up. Makes me crack up. I laughed at that. And the poem is, is hilarious. It uses some of the classic elements of satire in order to make its point. We learned a lot about satire this week. Satire, as a, as a structure, it uses four things in order to get your attention. It uses reversals, it uses exaggerations, it uses parody, and it uses incongruity, things that should match but that don't. In the case of Silverstein's work, he typically uses these devices just to make us laugh, only for the sake of laughter, or maybe for inspiration. If you read this poet, you'll see that He'll try to inspire kids. But, but these four tools of satire, they are typically employed for more serious reasons. This is often the toolkit of political cartoonists when they're trying to make their point. I've given you another example of a, of a cartoon that uses these elements of satire, and it's, it's on your bulletin as well. The next image that you have is a cartoon, and it, it's a bird sitting on an easy chair, ignoring the person in the cage screaming for help behind him. Um, and there's this man in a bird cage saying, help, 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 and the, the bird is sitting in his chair. He says, if he's singing, it means he's happy, right? So that's kind of a, a, a twisted use of satire, but you can see that this one is trying to make a point. This is from a very famous animal rights activist who uses political cartoons in order to illustrate what she thinks is a very important cause related to animal rights. The point of that satirical cartoon is, is evident. It's making a point about casual cruelty to animals. And that's often the way that satire is used. It's making a moral claim of some sort using reversals, exaggeration, parody, or incongruity. As I was sitting thinking of, of satire this week, I came to the ultimate example in our, in our day. Probably the best known example of a satire is the sitcom Seinfeld. Ever thought of it this way? The show is about four people living in New York City who are all clearly terrible, antisocial, selfish, unrelentingly tragic, 
and they are utterly hilarious, you know, for season after season. Episode after episode, scene after scene, it bears out this central fact, and it does it in the same way over and over again. Finally, in the very last episode of the entire series, Jerry and Elaine and George and Kramer are arrested for not helping a bystander who they watched get mugged, right? So in this pinnacle moment where they should have done the right thing, they again do what they typically do. Before they are found guilty of, quote, criminal indifference by the judge, their lawyer stands up and famously declares, you don't have to help anybody. That's what this country is all about. And it's in that single line that the entire show is summarized in a reversal, in a parody, in something that is humorously stated that is obviously not the case. So clearly the satire is very strong. We are meant to cringe as we smile and laugh at that line from the lawyer. It's in that final line that's uttered by this lawyer that we are meant to see the whole sitcom as one long lead up to this moment of inverted moral clarity. I don't know whether you like this sort of humor, I love this sort of humor, or how much experience you have with it, but it is very important to understand how it works because the book of Jonah works in much the same way, uses a lot of these same tools as a sort of satirical critique meant to wake the reader up, to help us to see ourselves. The other prophetic books, they contain the words of the prophets, and they offer them to us as a recorded um, sort of account in a rather straightforward way. But what's interesting is that the book of Jonah functions as a sort of divine satire. It's a book about a prophet, right? It's a prophetic word itself that is meant to reach our hearts by getting under our defenses in much the same way these prior examples do. So as we step into the story of Jonah this morning, we're going to pay attention to the way that our expectations are played into surprising reversals, stark reversals, and incongruities, and parodies, and amazing images that are all weaved together by God perfectly to make a profound and important point. And I'm just going to tell it to you so that you can track it all throughout the book. The point, the big turnaround, the reversal, the truth that Jonah is trying to make clear is that God loves our enemies more than we do. God loves our enemies more than we do. As we read Jonah 1, 1 to 17 this morning, we're going to encounter the puzzling behavior of a problematic prophet. This guy's a problem. He's a problematic prophet. He does not meet the expectations for what you would think a prophet would be. But furthermore, we're going to see the strange sight of some pious pagans, people who are not part of the Jewish faith, but who strangely seem to demonstrate righteousness, these pious pagan sailors. And finally, we're going to allow ourselves to be swallowed up by the surprising grace of God, which is operative all throughout this story. That's what we're going to see today as you read Jonah chapter 1. We'll read all the way to verse 17 follow along. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, and he went on board to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down 
and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up, hurl me into the sea, and then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us in innocent blood for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Wow. Probably not a story you needed me to remind you of. Right, probably something that you heard once as a kid and did not forget. It's one of the most amazing stories in all the Bible. It's, it's just incredible. As soon as we get into the story, we, we sense immediately that something is wrong. We meet a problematic prophet whose name literally means dove of truth. You have to look that up, but that's true. His, his name does actually mean that. Emmet means truth. Um, and Jonah means dove, so he's supposed to be a messenger of the truth. That's what his name means. But we're going to find that it's, it's a strange name for a prophet who doesn't do the two things that a prophet is supposed to do. He does not go, and he doesn't really speak. He doesn't actually say the thing that he's supposed to be saying to the people he's supposed to be saying it to. He's a prophet who, who doesn't go and who doesn't really speak. Verse 1 and 2 begin in, in a familiar way to us. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Now, it's not surprising to see the word of the Lord coming to a prophet of the Lord, especially one that we know something about already. Jonah has shown up in our Bibles already. It's 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25. And he last prophesied favor to the wicked king of Jeroboam II. So he's prophesied favor to somebody that, that the Bible clearly shows is wicked. But those prophecies were then later reversed by the prophet Amos. Amos goes and reverses these prophecies in chapter 6 of, of his account, 13 to 14. So, we don't know that much about Jonah, biblically, but we do know that the track record is already messy for this particular prophet of God. He's not batting 350. What's, what is surprising to read is who Jonah is sent to prophesy against. All right, this is where your attention would start to peak if you're reading this with normal expectations. Normally, the role of a prophet is to call God's own people, Israel, back into keeping with the law of God. It's the function of a prophet. 
calling the people of God back toward the law of God to, quote, do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with God, right? Micah 6, 8, you know what is, what is yours to do, O man. But Jonah is sent to a people outside the covenant structure of Israel. And remember, we're in the Old Testament. So, this is a, this is a peculiar thing to see. Furthermore, not only are these Ninevites not Jewish, but they are particularly hostile to God's people, and they would have represented to the original reader the very meaning of wickedness, right? The Ninevites were, were as bad as you could possibly have imagined, it's, at least in terms of national difference. So, already there is something fishy going on in this story. Why is Jonah being sent to these horrible, disgusting, godless Ninevites? Well, maybe he was asking the same question, right? Verse 3 gives us the next surprise. It says, but Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So, he paid the fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Notice all of the um, repetition that you see here. This is a really a very emphatic way of, of stating his action. And it's really a real, a real head spinner, right? This is, this is not what you would expect to see. In essence, a prophet of God in the first three verses has just given God the finger. That's, the, the, that's essentially what Jonah is doing. And that's why it's emphasized so clearly for you. To put the move in perspective, Tarshish might as well say in your Bible, Timbuktu, uh, in, in their time in reading this, Tarshish was as far away as you could possibly imagine from the center of, of the action. It was, it was like picking a point on the map that was like at the edge of the map and falling off. It, it's meant to represent the furthest possible point. Jonah probably looked at his map and said, how do I get as far away as possible? That's where I'll go. So Jonah isn't just not going to Nineveh. He is trying to get off of the map entirely. It's a real head spinner. It's not what you expect from a prophet of God. And the text emphasizes what we need to notice three different times in these three verses. There is something about the presence of the Lord that Jonah knows is incompatible with where he's at. He just, he just knows it. He acts on the basis of that he runs like a magnet away from the presence of the Lord, an inverted magnet. But the story carries on, and we see that God has other plans for Jonah. God hurls a great wind. The imagery is very graphic. It's as though God kind of grabs some wind, puts it together, and just throws it upon the sea. It's just a, a really wonderfully clear image that is meant to get your attention. He hurls a great wind upon the sea that the ship is sailing on. And the drama that comes next, it reveals even more of Jonah's puzzling heart condition in this moment. In the middle of the mess, the prophet of God isn't saying very much. He's already going in a direction we don't expect him to go, but, but maybe he'll speak. He doesn't seem to. The sailors have to ask him to explain who he is and what he's doing in order to make sense of their common predicament, right? So they are fighting for their lives, doing what sailors do, just trying not to capsize, and this guy who paid the fare is somehow asleep in the middle of the boat. Something is off. And it's only when they grab him by the collar, essentially, and shake the truth out of him that the prophet finally speaks. And what does he say? Well, they interrogate him, and, and out comes a pretty, a pretty straightforward answer. Oh, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. It's an important thing to include when you're on a boat that's about to sink, right? This is the kind of, kind of God you might want to be praying to in the moment that you're in a boat that is about to sink. If he made the sea and the dry land. So, you can imagine their face as they say, you're down here sleeping, and we are fighting for our lives, and you are the guy who has access to some God who made 
the very thing that's about to kill us. So what is going on? What do you know that we don't know? And you can imagine the frustration and the anger that they would have upon discovering this. But here's something deeper that I think is interesting that we see in this moment. When they shake his collar from a a place of, of pain and deep human predicament, and they say, account for yourself. What are you doing on our boat? Who are you? Out comes orthodoxy. Out comes truth. Out comes right doctrine. How interesting, Jonah. How helpful to know. Isn't it interesting that Jonah shows no regard for anyone's life in this situation? But when he is forced to account for himself, he pulls out his prophet card, and he suddenly knows his doctrine perfectly well. I think we're meant to feel the irony of that in this moment. The irony here is painful. There's an incongruity between who it is that Jonah represents and who it is that sent him and how he's behaving in the midst of the situation where real human life is on the line. They can't believe it, but sure enough, it's true. He's a problematic prophet who won't go and who barely speaks. And we laugh, so we don't cry. As Christians, we read of Jonah, and I believe we're meant to ask the question, why isn't Jonah doing what the Lord commanded him to do? Why won't this prophet who's tasked with bringing God's message actually go to the most wicked group of outsiders imaginable to tell them to repent before judgment falls? Is it fear for his own safety? It's possible. Is it hatred for them? I think the text will will show that that might be the case. Is it both of these things combined in some sort of an unknowing presupposition that's working on his heart? And the most penetrating question of all is, is this me? Is this me? Is there something in Jonah that is in me? A prophet who won't go to the people God sent him to, a prophet who won't speak the message that's been given to deliver, something is clearly wrong in Jonah's heart. And if I were to examine my life, if you were to look at my my week, minute by minute, my month, would you come away shaking your head, saying there's something wrong? (laughs) Dan gets up and talks like this and then lives like that? Make an account for yourself. Who are you? And what is going on? If you were to put yourself in the drama of what's happening with Jonah and you were able to get that, that, that satire eye view and look at your own life, do you feel any kinship with him? I think we're meant to. I think we're meant to feel a bit of what Jonah is getting at here. But Jonah is not the only perplexing character that we see in chapter 1. All about the ship Jonah has boarded to flee to Tarshish are these sailors, and they're pagans. They play a major role in the action, and there is a lot of detail about them and what they do. In fact, we come away with a very strange and perplexing realization that even though they are not Jews, they are not the people of God, these mariners, they seem to be pious pagans at least more pious than Jonah. And this is another unexpected reversal. A foreign pagan sailing crew, they're supposed to be the ones in the story who are far from God. After all, they come from the wrong lineage. They're not Abrahamic, and they worship the wrong gods and idols. You know this because they're trying every god in their chest, right? They're doing everything they can. Maybe this god, maybe that god. No, nah, it doesn't work. Throw it, over the, throw it overboard, dude. No one's coming. So they're running through their Rolodex of gods trying to get this storm to stop, and it's not stopping. They got, they're barking up the wrong tree. They are not exactly Yahweh worshipers. We know this because when they find Jonah in the hole, they entreat him to call out to your God. The the idea is, we went through our Rolodex of gods, bro. We're going down. You got a God? You got one? Who Who do you know, right? Get up here. Wake up. 
That's, that's how they look at this. And they go down there and they grab him uh, and they, they ask him to call out to his God. Why? Perhaps the God will give a thought to us, you bum. Perhaps your God might care about us. You don't seem to care about us very much. I just had to wake you up, right? That's the idea here. <laughs> Sleeping Jonah sure doesn't care. Maybe his God does. Why not try? We're about to die, right? Great witness, Jonah. Good job. But these pagan sailors are the ones demonstrating righteousness. When Jonah tells them who he is and why the storm is happening, conveniently he knows exactly what's going on. Jonah selfishly asks them to kill him. Think of what he's now asking them to do in the midst of an angry deity situation. I'm going to ask you to commit the worst sin you can commit right now uh, in this situation. Man, the things that Jonah will do to avoid the presence of God and the work of God. I think it's so interesting. Do these sailors immediately comply? Do they say, all right, man, you know, death wish Jonah, whatever, like over the side of the boat with you, I guess, right? They don't do that. It shows that they actually row harder to try to get this guy to dry land. They act righteously. They don't want to kill him. The text indicates that they try to actually row the ship in in the midst of this storm to drop Jonah off on the land. Maybe then Jonah can go fulfill his mission alive. But the waves are too big. The sailors plead with God to hold them guiltless as they throw Jonah into the sea. And they don't seem all that godless after all. But actually, they show the kind of consideration for human life that we might have expected to see from Jonah, the Hebrew prophet. And furthermore, just to make it even more clear, these pious pagans, they stop and they actually worship Yahweh once the sea calms down. They offer a sacrifice to Him. They make vows in response to the sea being calmed. And these guys, they get the message in a way that Jonah still doesn't. As Christians, we should notice the irony in the fact that, that these pagan sailors are acting more righteously than Jonah. These people who are supposed to be morally inferior to Jonah are showing themselves in, in this telling to be just the opposite. Jonah can't be bothered to obey God, but these pagans are quick to worship him once he delivers. Are we supposed to care about these people? Does God care about these people? Wait a minute. What's going on? Finally, when it seems that the story could, could not get any more surprising, the most surprising thing of all happens. And we have it right here, another intervention from God right when our expectations would not normally predict it. You have it in verse 17. In the mouth of this great fish that, that comes and swallows Jonah up, we see that, that Jonah is seemingly being swallowed up by a graceful God. So, we've seen a problematic prophet, we've seen pious pagans, and then now, as to put his stamp on, on the sovereignty of the situation, God acts through this fish. And we see a, an amazing reversal. I think this is the key reversal of chapter 1, where you would expect that a character so wretched as Jonah would now get what he deserves, thrown to his, his watery grave. You might expect that, that that's what he would get because it's what he deserves. What you see instead is that he receives wild, unexpected grace. He deserves a watery grave, and yet he gets wild grace. And we are just surprised to find it and to see the shape that it takes. And I, I had to sit back and ask this question of myself and, and, and kind of as myself as a Christian, and I think it, it's a question that we can ask at this point of verse 17. As Christians, do we find the grace of God to be so blessedly invasive for us as it was for Jonah? You know, Jonah's wish in this moment is just, just to be over with it, just kill me, just throw me over the side, the last thing I'm going to do is, go, is turn to God in this moment. And yet it's exactly in that, that place of just 
rejection, really, and disobedience, that, that God's grace still breaks in upon him in, in a really invasive and unexpected way. And we're going to see that in the next chapter, it provides this opportunity for him to repent. So, the question, do we allow the surprising, overwhelming grace of God to redirect our hearts when we are off course? I, I, I was sitting with this passage this week and trying to think, what is, what is the fish representing here? And it's the fact that, that this overwhelming grace of God is meant to redirect our hearts and to take us where we are going, despite ourselves, that that's the role of grace in the world. It's the role of God's action. It's a beautiful thing. As we've seen in this first chapter of Jonah, it feels like the joke is partially on us. The humorous structure of the story, it's not a laughing matter, and it concerns the very depth and the very breadth of God's grace. And we're going to see these themes, these, re- these amazing reversals, these incongruities continue to teach us throughout the rest of the story. But as we read Jonah 1 today, we encountered the puzzling behavior of a problematic prophet, and we saw the strange sight of some pious pagan sailors. And finally, we allowed ourselves to be swallowed up by the surprising grace of God and allowed this to stir reflections about what God's grace means in our lives. I'll pray, invite the team back up. Father, we thank you um, for Scripture. Through Scripture, you, you address the deepest places of our hiding, the deepest places of, of our blame shifting, and you call us out into a, a place of flourishing, a place where your justification has spoken the better word over our sin, a place where there can be freedom and life. Pray, Lord, as we think on this first chapter of Jonah this week and we allow the imagery to stir up the questions that draw us closer to you, Lord, that that you just would impress that upon us. Um, Help us to remain open to what you're saying in the book of Jonah. We love you. We trust you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.